And it's actually going to be called past and present and not really talk to the future. Uh, because I think this meeting is actually going to be directed towards the future. So I'm just going to give some history. We've talked a little bit about it, but I just want to take us all back to understanding what we've done and where we've been, because we learn lessons from our past. And we've got to learn from our mistakes as well as our successes. So we started in the 1800s, the branding of the cattle and the horse. And then in the 1950s, we vaccinated against bovine brucellosis, and those animals were tagged in order to move. So we started with some type of requirement for movement of animals. In the 1980s, the U.S. Animal Health Association emphasized the need for animal identification in cases of animal health emergencies, and that includes your natural disasters that we've been talking about. So that is the history of identification of ownership, disease purpose, and emergency. So why do we want to identify animals? And I've just captured some of these that we've talked about this morning. That whole theft. Cattle wrestlers and horse wrestlers are still out there. They're still swapping horses and identification. Horse care. We want to make sure the horse gets the right antibiotic or right treatment. So we need to be able to make sure that the horse that was prescribed is the one that's receiving that medication. Emergencies. So if there's a flood or if there's an earthquake or something of a natural disaster, those horses are going to end up going somewhere. In the recent fires, misplacing these horses and moving these horses around, we need to be able to identify them. And in some cases, we talk about temporary identification versus permanent identification. Wouldn't it be great if everything had a permanent identification and we didn't have to talk about temporary? <coughs> Excuse me. Health certificates have been talked about this morning. We've, as a state animal health official, I can tell you the things that we see as far as identification blows your mind some days. You know, the name, the very good description to the very bad description. So again, we need to think about that. Traceability. Traceability is not just for our purposes, but for insurances as far as, <coughs> sorry, assurances as far as where our horses have been and where they're going to. We talked about it today, linking that identification to their performance record to what they have done and what they've accomplished. We want to make sure the right horse gets the right credit. And I think the number one reason is consumer confidence, and we've talked about that today. Whether it's racing integrity or the show horse integrity, the consumer really wants to know that we're doing our best and that those horses are truly the horses that are identified on paper. So we've talked about the various methods over time. The permanent physical description the photographs, the lip tattoos, branding, DNA testing, iris scanning, and microchipping. And I'm going to take this opportunity to just look at the pluses and minuses of these technologies. So if we look at a physical description, so we're looking at the old age, breed, sex, their conformation, their coat color, their markings, their whorls, the scars, the chestnuts. Well, I have to say not everyone remembers a half stocking versus a sock and a stocking and a sock. Who knows if this is really a star-striped snip or what the actual marking is. We can have people that describe completely different the same horse. So this is an example of a six-year-old standard-bred stallion. No face markings or leg markings and no scars. Is this the same horse? It's actually not. There are two different horses here. They're actually two different horses on the same property with the same background. So they're a little bit built differently, but if we look at a description, we're not going to be able to tell these two apart. Physical description, again, black Frisian four-year-old mares. Black Frisian mare. I'm pretty sure, even if you said it had a whirl here or there, I'm pretty sure we could find a similar pattern. So again, a physical description is not giving us an individual identification. And a physical description, these all look the same when they're miles running by you. Again, a standard bread is bay. We have different shades of bay, but describing them becomes a challenge when we talk only a physical description. 
So we talk further about paper. Well, we have the description. We just looked at the pictures. And on paper, we could write that two million different ways with different characteristics. So again, the paper is not truly going to identify that horse to 100% accuracy. We talk about passports. There were several mentioned this morning. The one that I have demonstrated here is the Federation Equestrian International, the FEI passports for horses moving international. Again, it's a paper documentation. That paper documentation with the FEI has a microchip, but not all passports have that. So if we're not linking it to a unique identifier and we're linking it just to the physical description of the horse, again, the accuracy is there. Does the consumer have confidence in knowing that horse is truly the horse? So I'm going to go further and talk about branding. We first started with our hot iron brands that were used by the Egyptians. It's the oldest method of identification known. And then we talk about the hot iron brand actually produces a third degree dermal skin burn. That is an invasive procedure on a horse. We've now transitioned to more freeze branding. And that is using a branding iron that's been chilled with dry ice or liquid nitrogen. That freeze brand is just damaging the pigment producing hair cells to cause that animal's hair to grow back white. For lighter horses, it has to keep that brand on longer so that sometimes we actually eliminate the hair follicle altogether and it's the bare skin that shows the brand. Theoretically, there's less damage to the hide with a freeze brand than the hot iron brand. And theoretically, they're supposed to be more visible. So let's look at some of the advantages of the branding. So yes, it's low cost. I say difficult to alter, but some of us that have done some disease investigations have seen some brands that have been altered. So it can be altered, it's just not as likely. The disadvantages is it causes pain and stress in the animal. It's difficulty to read if it's not done properly, if it's a smudged brand. Some of these brands are like the freeze brands, like in the standard bread, those are official identification. But if they're not done properly and they're smudged or not done, it's hard to, hard to read. They're not typically an individual identifier. Typically they're just the brand, the owner brand. Again, difficultly to read. Some people call them unsightly. And it can be a safety issue. Can you click on that, Scott? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a safety issue. <laughs> so we won't show it again, but it's a YouTube video, so just search it out. So again, branding can be a safety issue, not just to the horse, but the individual who's applying the brand. So there's several breed registries that use brands out there. So we do see these brands. Again, these are a brand of the breed. It's not an individual identifier, but it's an added tool when we're describing the horse. When we do our description, we can say that it has a brand of whatever organization on its right hip, left hip. So these are just some examples of some of those brands that are, some of them are easier to see and some of them are hard to see. So again, brand is just one identifier and in this case, it would not be a unique identifier as used in these horses. Lip tattoo. We talked about it this morning, the Jockey Club talked about it. We do know that those organizations use lip tattooing as late as the 1800s. Um, they, the reason behind it, is, behind it was to eliminate cheating. So again, we wanted that consumer confidence. It's on the inner aspect of the upper lip. As um, uh, Dr. Fly mentioned earlier, for those of us who have read some of these tattoos, over time as they get older, some of these are very ineligible, in not legible, and we can't read them. So again, they are a permanent identification and it's unique to that horse. It's difficult to alter, but again, I put it also on the disadvantaged side because we have seen them altered. We have seen people mess them up just so that we wouldn't know who that horse is. It is linked to the registration in some of these cases um, so that we know that that horse is that horse. There has been concerns raised over the years that there's potential for disease spread if it's not done properly, meaning it's not cleaned and disinfected. 
And we're talking specifically recent discussions have occurred on equine infectious anemia and equine pyroplasmosis. So again, there's a disease threat risk for this method of identification. As we said, it's difficult to read and it fades over time. So these are just some examples and I, I, they don't portray very well up here, um, but I tried to get some that are really easy to see up here on the upper left to a little bit more difficult and to the lower one that I could not make out that third one if my life depended on it. So usually when I call a, a registry and I say, well, I have a first and a second and maybe a fourth and a fifth, and you know, they'll have to help me out in figuring out what this is. So again, it's, it's an a individual identifier, but it is one of those that is challenging to read and challenging for consistency and accuracy of information for us. So it's been alluded to here a little bit today, iris scanning, there has been to, uh, people work, working on this since about 2000 when the Japanese researchers actually reported the reliability of iris scanning in horses and it's a non-invasive procedure and that's what they were selling it as. It's a non-invasive procedure that could uniquely identify a horse. So the high, high resolution camera produces a digital image of the horse's eye. It uses patterns in the iris and they say no two irises are identical and that's why they can do this iris scanning. And the infrared camera actually measures the numerous points in the iris so that they can actually, again, uniquely identify with that, there is an algorithm that can serve as the horse identification number. So the machine does its uh, reading and there's an algorithm, algorithm that actually gives you a number at the end that is assigned to your horse. The issue is there are cataracts, uh, excuse me, they say that cataracts and glaucoma don't diminish the uh, ability to read um, the iris in the front of the eye because the iris is in the front of the eye, excuse me. However, there are some uh, evidence out there that changes in the eye over time can interfere with this iris scanning. So what are we looking at when we look at the, the use of iris scanning, when we look at that as a method of identification for horses? It is accurate. It is non-invasive, and that's really the biggest benefit of this uh, tool. It is non-invasive. It has limited ability to be uh, altered. Obviously, when there is some type of ocular in injury, there could be some iris damage. So that would affect your iris scan. The dis disadvantages is it's expensive with limited equipment and the logistics of actually getting the iris scanning equipment and putting it into practice. So again, there are some logistical issues that become a challenge. But again, this is the only one that they are putting out there as non-invasive besides your physical description of the horse which we also saw, already said was a challenge to actually describe the horse. So we talked about it already earlier. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the breed uh, registries do use DNA typing, whether it's the stallions, um, foals, that sort of thing. Um, and they talked about the hair uh, sample being collected. So again, this is a tool that has been used. And we've talked about the benefits um, from the great presentation from the Arabian Horse Association gave their example of how they've used it over time. So it is a, a, a way of typing the DNA of that horse and is useful as an identifier of that horse. It has accuracy, it's minimally invasive, has limited ability to be altered. It, is exp it can be expensive when you're doing it for your own personal reason to identify the horse and not going through a registry. Um, and again, it's a logistics issue. So just to look at um, the different equine identification methods that are available out there. And when, when you look at what we want to do, we want something that's accurate, reliable, ideally non-invasive, safe or low disease risk, security, we don't want it to be altered, and we want quickly to identify those horses. And ease of use, and always the horse owner's favorite, low cost, because they don't want to spend the money, as we talked about earlier. So when we look at these, and some of these are subjective decisions on where things can be placed, but if you look at what's out there, yes, physical description is non-invasive, but it's not accurate, and it's not reliable. The two, same two people identifying a horse can change their opinion in a month or two months time. 
So we also have security of identification. Well, we have the best security is something that's in the horse that can't be changed. And that's going to be your microchip. And your microchip is also going to be the one that's accurate and reliable that can be read the same over time. And we're going to talk more specifically about microchips in the future, in future presentations, so I'm not going to go into microchips. But we're just looking at this for comparison. So low cost, the only thing that's low cost is going to be a physical description. But then you have to combat that with accuracy and reliability. So what I'm here to say is there's no ideal system that meets all of the parameters that the horse owner has articulated. We've talked about cost. We've talked about invasiveness. We've talked about security of that identification. And really what it comes down to is moving to the future, we have to look at what is going to provide us the most accurate information for moving forward. So when we think about going out and doing a health certificate or getting Coggins papers on the horse, yes, we're using that paper to identify the horse. That is official identification, but it's concerning when we can't always confirm that that is the true horse that's on that paper is what's being described when we only go with a physical description. So the future, as we talked about today, is microchipping. And I'm not getting into the pluses and minuses of microchipping because we have a whole panel on microchipping. I'm just bringing you from where we were in brands, lip tattoos, iris scanning, DNA, to say what did we learn from our past. We learned from our past that we do have folks out there that are going to alter things. We did learn that nothing is 100% effective in meeting the needs of the industry. We also have to learn how we're going to explain the benefits of each of these. Because how did somebody come up with branding an animal? Think about that. Way back when, when branding came up, who thought that it was a really good idea to take a really hot iron and brand a cow or a horse? I'm sure the guy in the video thought it was a really good idea that it was a simple job of branding, but it, he realized it wasn't as easy as it looked and there was potential negative effects. So we have to think about how we've transitioned in equine identification over the years and learn from it to move forward. Again, we are here to protect equine health. We are here to protect the horse industry. That's our mission. And identification, as everyone said this morning, linking it to health, linking it to biosecurity, is critical for the future of our industry. But we can't do it alone. We need everyone in this room to come together to promote equine identification and traceability. Because alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much, as Helen Keller once said. Thank you.